I welcome the Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, Minister Di Farmer, Leader of the Opposition, Deb Preckleton, Ros Bates, Opposition Minister for Health and Women, Senator Larissa Waters, Kay McGrath, Chair of the Domestic Violence Implementation Council, our other speakers, members of parliament who've come out to join us, and um, everyone who cares about ending domestic violence. Thank you for being here. This is now 10 years since we started holding Red Rose rallies. We yearn for the day when we're not doing it anymore. But why today became so special is the past month, today's the last day of that month, the past month in Australia, 11 women have been murdered. We talked about one woman a week being murdered. So when it got to four and to five and to six, I started to think this has gone way beyond normal. When it got to seven, we started to think, surely we're going to have a public conversation. We're going to acknowledge this is the now a national crisis and we got to 11. Through the month, we've had conversations about all sorts of things. Some of them are critically important, like our drought, but others, I don't know. Does a cricket ball become more important than a woman's life? Strawberries, signs on the White House, oh, sorry, the White House, um, signs on our Opera House. And we've had, every day, there's something that becomes more important and it gets pushed aside. Today I'll be talking about some uncomfortable truths. We've had 11 women die across Australia. The youngest was 22 and the eldest was 83. They lived in cities, they lived on farms, they lived on remote Aboriginal communities, they lived in regional towns. They were women that only had one thing in common, they are all killed by violent men. So today, I want to have a conversation about men and violence. I want to have that conversation without people saying to me, Betty, not all men. Or what about men? Or what about women and their violence? These women were killed by men and their violence. And yes, we all know good men. We have them in our families and in our communities and among us today. We do know that women can be violent, but that's not why we're here. We're here because of men and men's violence. We're here because we want to break the silence and say no more. That if we as a community can tolerate this, then we really lose the right to be saying we're a civilised society. That we allow 11 women to be slaughtered. One of the women that was killed had a five month old baby. I saw on Facebook last night, someone had set up a GoFundMe to care for that baby. You know, what have, what have we become that this becomes the norm? That it becomes the norm that women are killed and we, it hardly raises an eyebrow. So thank you for being here. We have quite a few speakers, but I think our message is many voices, one message, and the message is ending violence. I'd like to call on the Premier of Queensland to address us. I'm very honoured that she's stepped out of Parliament to be with us, so please give her a warm welcome. And thank you very much, Betty. Can I first of all acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I thank uh, everyone for coming out today? to show our support for ending violence in our community. I'm very honoured today to be joined with nearly all members of the Queensland Parliament. And from the outset, can I say to the men and women that are here today, we have to do more. We have to do more as a community to end violence against women. As Betty said, 11 women have been killed across Australia in this past month. And just recently, up in Cairns, we saw the tragic death of Toya, a very young woman 
going about her normal Sunday afternoon activities, walking her dog along a beach. And having arrived in Cairns, after hearing about that tragic death, there was an outpouring of emotion from the far north Cairns community about how could this happen in a local community. And people are searching for answers and we plead for people to come forward with any evidence that can help solve this horrific crime. Too much violence is happening in our community and we need to do more. That's why I'm very pleased our response to the Not Now, Not Ever report is being implemented. But it takes a whole community to respond. And I think Betty touched on something very important. It starts with respectful relationships. And we have now rolled out respectful relationships across our schools in Queensland. But respectful relationships just don't happen in the school ground or in the classroom. They happen at home. And we need that respect to be in the, in the home just as much as it is in the workplace, just as much as it is uh, in the school ground. So we need to do more. We need to stand up as a community and say no to violence. And I think today, with everyone coming together, we show that we stand strong as a community. We are in this together. And we say no to violence. We say no to violence. So thank you everyone for coming along today to support this Red Rose Rally, to show our support for the women who have tragically lost their lives. Those women should be with us here today. This senseless violence that happens in our community has just got to stop and we will not leave any stone unturned until we stamp out this violence amongst our communities. Thank you very much for joining me here today. It's an honour and a privilege to be here with so many people dedicated to this course. Thank you, Premier. Um, in stamping out violence, I think we've got to really reframe in our society who we see as our heroes and our sheroes. I was reading last night about that legend so-called legend in football, ben, ben Cousins, threatened to bury his partner alive, said he would take the children to play on her grave. We can't have people with these attitudes elevated through sport, through government, through the community, through business leaders. Our saying no has to be saying no to people with attitudes about violence. I'd now, um, before I introduce our next speaker, I, I meant to say earlier how thrilled I am that we have people here from both sides of Parliament and Senator Larissa Green as well, that this is a non-partisan issue, that we will only resolve this. We gather here today, not as politicians belonging to a party, we gather as humans saying these are women that didn't deserve this. And by putting aside the politics, we're actually paying the tribute and paying the honour to them that they deserve. I'd like to invite the opposition leader, Deb Prentleton, to speak to us now. Thank you, Deb. Thank you very much, Betty. Thank you very much, Betty, and to everyone that has gathered here today, because there is nothing more important than stopping violence against women in our community. Not just violence in the domestic violence, but also sexual violence and against children as well. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to join with the Premier and almost all of our parliamentary colleagues standing here today in front of all of you as a bipartisan agreement that we need to do everything that we can do to stop violence. The parliamentarians that are standing here with you today all have the jobs of representing our communities. Our job is to represent you. And that is what we're here to do today, to speak on behalf of those women who are unable to be here, who were part of our communities, who are part of everything that means so much to us. Uh, and that is exactly what we do when we come down here to this house and represent you. 
As someone from regional Queensland, I know that this doesn't stop at the bounds or the outside of any area. We need to stop violence and raise the awareness of what happens to people everywhere across Australia and in particular all the way across our regions. We need to ensure that people have somewhere safe to go and that isn't only in bricks and mortar or wood, it's actually someone safe to talk to as well. So it gives me great pleasure to be here today along with all of my parliamentary colleagues from both sides and join with the Premier in uniting in stopping violence against women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. And thank you for mentioning sexual violence. It's the last day of um, Sexual Violence Prevention Month. So an important message that we need to get out into the community as well. During this past week, I've read a news article about the things that women were doing before they died. Caring for family, walking their dogs, cooking meals. But the thing the article never mentioned was trying to stay alive. I know there are women here today with us that are living and leaving violence. I know there are families here who have experienced the horror of a family member being murdered. And it's not just these 11 women. The heartache that they will leave behind in shattered families goes on for years. We have members of our own Red Rose gatherings, our Red Rose advocates, some who couldn't be here today. They needed to just take time out and say, we've had enough, and we honour that. But for those women who are struggling every day to stay alive, we're with you as well. I sit on the Queensland Domestic Violence Death Review Board. Our meetings, we troll through the shattered rooms of someone's life. And I often think, if we could only just rewind so we're not doing this. There were so many missed opportunities. And the Attorney General's here today. Sorry, I've missed introducing you. My apologies. I believe the report from the Death Review uh, Board is um, going to be tabled this week. When it's made public, it'll be on the Coroner's Office website. Please, I implore you, read it. We need to learn from those deaths. We need to learn so we aren't going through this time and time again. I'd now like to introduce the Honourable Di Farmer, Minister for Child Safety, Youth and Women and the Minister for the Prevention of Domestic Violence. Di, you're always welcome. Di has been joining our Red Rose rallies now over many years, from our small gatherings to our large. Um, and so it's always a pleasure. So thank you, Di. Thanks so much, Betty, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathering and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I want to especially acknowledge Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and the Opposition Leader, Deb Frecklington, um, and all of the Members of Parliament. I know the Premier, I know Deb, have pointed out that just about every single Member of Parliament is here today, and uh, that is a strong statement. Please let us tell you that is a strong statement about the intent of this government, of this parliament, to do every single thing that we can to stamp out domestic and family violence, to stamp out gendered violence. We, uh, we have had a terrible month. Uh, we have heard those stories of 11 women killed in Australia. Toy accordingly, the most recent one, and we wake up and we hear that news and we think, surely, Surely not another one. Surely, how can this be happening? And uh, the grief of those families and the supporters of those communities, that someone was just doing what they do every day, a woman was doing something she loved, like walking a dog, that that is an unsafe thing to do. And I can say to you, we cannot have women thinking that they have to worry about being safe every single minute of their day. It's just not okay. Shocking as those statistics are, many of you will know 
that the ongoing statistics around domestic and family violence are just terrible. One in four women have experienced domestic and family violence. If you are a woman with an intellectual disability, you have a 90, 90 percent chance of having been sexually assaulted. So this is Australia that we are talking about and these are the statistics that we are faced with. What that means is that every single person who is here today, and thank you that there are so many of you who've come out, every single one of us knows somebody who has been sexually assaulted or, or a victim of domestic and family violence. There will be people in this audience who are victims. And in fact, Betty, Betty I, can I can remember, remember the last Red Rose rally we had here just, just a couple of months ago. ago. Um, I turned around and said, said hello to a couple of young women who were just standing next to me. One said, I was just raped around the corner there. The other one said, I was sexually assaulted at South Bank last week. Um, there are people everywhere and it is our job to call that out. And we must, we must take that responsibility. Um, government, the parliament, we cannot do this alone. We all, we all have to do something about this. We recently ran something called the Bystander Campaign and many of you will be aware of that. And uh, we were saying to everybody, everybody please just do one thing. And we know, and Betty knows only too well from the Domestic Violence Death Review Board, that every death in the last 12 months could have been prevented because there was at least one person who knew what was going on and they didn't do anything. So we can all say, mm, you know, it's not really our business or why doesn't she leave him? Or we can all have our views, but we all must call it out. We can't just be here today. We have to take that next step. We're not asking people to put themselves in harm's way, but we are saying, do that one thing. Say, are you okay? Offer to go and have a cup of coffee with someone if you think that they're really suffering. Point out the website to them. But we all together, we can do just one thing and we can make a difference. And we all want to make that difference. So we have these terrible statistics. We have, we have these terrible things going on every single day, but our strength is in all of us. Our strength is in the fact that we are saying, no, we're not, we are not this society. We are not going to be defined by this. And so we can do our bit. And I say to you, thank you so much for what you're doing. And I want to really compliment Betty and the whole Red Rose Foundation because they never ever let us forget. And there are many other people who've been working in this sector for many, many years, year in, year out, seeing the depravity, seeing the damage. And I want to thank all of those people because they have made such a difference. And now it's our job, we're gonna make a difference ourselves too. So thank you again and thank you so much again to Betty and everyone here. Thank you, Di. Um, before I go on, I just want to introduce my friend Dan. Dan is selling red roses and half of what he is selling is going to homeless services and half to the Red Rose Foundation. Thank you, Dan, for being here. And give Dan a round of applause. Thank you. Later, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, we're going to um, move on to um, be remembering the women that have died. And Yasmin is... Um, we're going to um, remember each woman that's died. When we do this... Um, the first instance, um, Yasmin will read out a name and she will read out who was going to come and lay a red rose for them and then we will invite others to do the same. 
Thank you, Yes. Thank you, Betty. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Yasmin Khan and I'm a director of the Red Rose Foundation. Um, I'll start, this is where we're going to lay our flowers, um, so if we're all aware of that. So we'll start off, I call on the Premier to lay a flower for the memory of Nicole Cartwright, 32, from New South Wales. I call on Deb Frecklington to lay a flower for Gail Potter, 46, from Victoria. I call Di Farmer to lay a flower for Christy Powell, 39, of New South Wales. I call Senator Larissa Waters to lay a flower for Daniil Goodsell from Victoria. I call Ros Bates to lay a flower for Jacqueline Francis, 50, of West Australia. I call Kay McGrath to lay a flower for Irana Nahu, 43, from New South Wales. I call Brian Sullivan to lay a flower for Toy Accordingly, 24, from Queensland. I call Betty Taylor to lay a flower for Betty Cause, 83, from New South Wales, who died yesterday. I call Sherelle Moody to lay a flower for a publicly unnamed woman from the Kimberleys in West Australia. I call Karen Walsh to lay a flower for a publicly unnamed woman from Mpoon in North Queensland. And I call Tim Class Orloff to lay a flower for a publicly unnamed woman from Victoria. Ladies and gentlemen, they're the 11 women that have died this year, or the, sorry, this month. For those others that wish to lay a flower, you can do so now. Thank you everyone. I'm aware that we're needing to move on because people needing to get back to Parliament. So without further ado, I'll call on Senator Larissa Waters. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you so much, Betty. Hi everyone. I add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. 58 so far this year and as we've heard today, there's already been 11 this month. Now, we're all used to the figures of one woman a week. It's been more than double that this month. This is a national emergency. 
And I moved a motion in the Senate two weeks ago calling it that, saying that this was a national security issue and begging for more funding for frontline response services, for prevention services and begging for paid domestic violence leave for survivors. Now that motion passed, but it was on the voices. No one had to vote on that. And you won't be surprised to learn that nothing's happened since. Instead, we've had various other uh, male senators call for an office of men, for example, in our Senate estimates. Um, is it any wonder that we see this epidemic of violence when we have our institutions, certainly federally, still dominated by men? And we need to have this conversation about what's driving domestic violence. All of the experts will tell us that it's gender inequality that is behind this violence. There's a whole range of factors, but that is one of the key drivers. Now, if we look around society, we're actually doing quite well in the Queensland Parliament, and I want to acknowledge and commend both our female Premier and our female opposition leader, and all of the members of Parliament here. But we're doing not too bad in terms of gender representation in our Queensland State Parliament. We're doing very poorly in our Federal Parliament. We're at 30%. We still see female sports stars, for example, fighting to get free-to-air TV coverage, fighting for equal pay. Um, most of us are still fighting for equal pay. We still have a gender pay gap. We still have these huge drivers of inequality and these huge examples of inequality in our daily existence. It's those issues that we need to address, as well as funding those frontline emergency response services if we are to actually eliminate violence against women and their children. And yet we hear complete silence from our Prime Minister. Sure, he's only been in the job, what, two months now, but he has said nothing about this epidemic of violence. Absolutely nothing. And as I was talking with Betty earlier, and she was lamenting that there's now been this creeping silence on this issue again. I feel like a couple of years ago, this was really on the national agenda and some of our members of the media did wonderful work bringing this to light, bringing it out of the shadows, calling it out driving that cultural and behavioural change, sending that message to all members of our society that we are all equal and that violence is not okay and will be condemned and publicly called out. We had that real zenith in the movement. And yet since then, what with Rosie Batty's wonderful tenure as our Australian of the Year finishing with a few changes of Prime Ministers, it really feels like this issue is going into the shadows again. And is it any wonder that we now see our numbers up Women are being murdered in their homes, on the streets, for having the temerity of walking their dog or, or walking home late at night. This is an epidemic of violence against women and their children. And we all need to do something about this. We need to drive that cultural and behavioural change in our own spheres of influence. But we desperately need our national government to show some national leadership. I asked in estimates last week, where is the money for frontline emergency response services? Um, they fund housing, they fund community legal centres, it flows through to the states and the state agencies then distribute it down to the wonderful services like Betty's and many other frontline not-for-profit services helping women in their most dire hour of need. So I asked the various departments, where is the money? When is it coming? Uh, has there been a boost in these funding services? And the initial response was, oh, that's not our problem. That's what the states do. And I took them to task. I said, no, you are the source of funding for many of these um, housing programs that flow through to domestic violence shelters. You are the source of funding for many of the community legal centres that then do the outreach um, and that help women fleeing violence. Don't you dare say this isn't your responsibility. So we will keep advocating for more funding for frontline emergency response services. We will keep advocating for funding for prevention. We can't just mop up. We have to stop this where it starts. And that's down to all of us claiming our space in the public sphere and in the private sphere. Um, kudos again to our female politicians here in this state parliament and to all of us in the federal parliament. We need to get equal representation everywhere in society. Um, not just in the parliament, at those higher echelons of big business, in the community sector, um, as, as various people within the media spotlight. We need to take our place and show that equality can happen and that that is what it will take to eliminate violence against women. So I'm proud to stand uh, with all of you today. I want to commend all of the services. I want to send a message to these women and to their families. We will never forget you and we will never give up fighting for your right to be safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Larissa. Um, I'm going to probably just say something a little bit controversial here and a call to the Premier. Um, we've seen the implementation of the reforms and I acknowledge the services out there, both government and um, not-for-profits are doing a great job. 
but I'd be remiss to say, if I didn't say women are falling through the cracks. Last week, um, together with Yasmin and I'd vest, we had to move a mum and her four kids out of Australia. That was the only way they could be safe. Neither I'd vest or the Red Rose Foundation get public money. We started a GoFundMe to feed them. It wasn't for the one of us trying. Last week, we also assisted in paying a legal bill for a woman that got no legal aid. Experienced horrendous violence. So while we acknowledge the good work that's been doing, we d we're not going to get any further if we keep cementing the cracks. What I'm calling on is the establishment of an independent, overarching body that monitors domestic violence. We have an Ombudsman's office and I've spoken to them. They will see complaints brought by women against individuals working within government services. But I think we need something broader than that. We have complaints departments about everything from motor vehicles, health, you name it. But we don't have anywhere that women can go. The Red Rose Foundation has become the end of the line and we don't want to be there. I don't want to be getting calls on a Sunday morning for a woman crying because she's so desperate and she's saying he's going to kill me. We don't want to be in that place. We don't want to be in the place where we see through the death reviews that women have gone from agency to agency to agency. We want to protect the living. We're learning from the dead but to protect the living. We would love to see the establishment of an overarching body that women can go to that's independent of all of us. So that's my call today. Um, um, I'd now like to call on Ros Bates MP, member from Mudraba. Ros has also been a supporter of um, the work we do and attended many of the Red Rose rallies, particularly those we held on the Gold Coast. So please welcome Ros. Thank you, Betty, and um, it's a shame we have to be here again today. I think I say this at every Red Rose rally that we have, um, that we are yet again commemorating the death of a woman that shouldn't have happened. Um, and I think we know that women are falling through the cracks and whilst the Not Now, Not Ever review was a landmark reform and it has bipartisan support, there are still women dying. And for those of you who know me, I'm not here today as a politician, I'm here as a survivor myself of 13, 15 years of domestic violence and my mum 35 years. So when I look around the crowd here and I see fellow survivors, families who even worse have lost their loved ones, it still breaks my heart. And it brings back memories every time and it will bring back memories for you. And every one of these red rose ceremonies brings back memories as well. We are seeing, as Betty said, women falling through the cracks. Uh, we know that uh, there are women out there tonight uh, with nowhere to go. Uh, women who are not sure what to do next um, or that whether or not the services are there to wrap around them. We on the Gold Coast, unfortunately, had the um, history of being uh, one of the worst domestic violence places in Queensland. And I've had the privilege of meeting and working with some amazing women. People like Chelsea Schilling's mother, uh, people like Tara Brown's mother, uh, Teresa Bradford's mother, all horrendous murders. And in fact, the last murder on the Gold Coast was actually in my electorate in Wurrungaree. And a lot of the domestic violence murders aren't what you would expect. They're not necessarily the ones who get beaten up every weekend like I did and my sisters and my mum did. It's the coercive controlling behaviours it's those ones that we don't have an ability to capture under law at the moment. Um, I personally believe that we should have a separate offence for domestic violence, which would pick up those coercive controlling behaviours, financial abuse and elder abuse. And the woman on the Gold Coast in Wurrungaree, uh, we know that that was financial abuse. Uh, so we're seeing uh, still problems in the system. We have got a long way to go. We've done a lot. Women are coming out and speaking now. Even just in my own area, um, the police tell me they've had a 96% increase 
in women coming forward with domestic violence complaints. That's a good thing. I don't know whether domestic violence has actually increased or people are brave enough uh, to come out and speak. It took me 35 years to tell my story, so I'm hoping that others now, with all of the publicity and the legislation and the bipartisan support, that women will come forward, not only with domestic violence, sexual violence, but also family violence. And one should never forget the kids of domestic violence because they take it with them through their whole entire lives. We are seeing, we, here in Queensland, we passed strangulation laws, which were really desperately needed. But what we're seeing on the Gold Coast is that they're being pled bargain down from strangulation just to assault. And we're seeing men um, walking away, either on bail or with a slap over the wrist for attempted strangulation. We know that you are 800 times more likely to become the victim of domestic homicide if you've previously been throttled by your partner. But we also know that non-lethal strangulation is a big issue. Women are dying months and years later from clots because it's being strangled. Uh, so we need to close that gap too. And we need to make sure that the magistrates are making the same determinations across this state. The domestic violence courts have been really welcome on the Gold Coast, but in other areas around the state, we see magistrates making determinations on either bail or GPS trackers or strangulation um, that should not. Um, under the intent of our laws, what we all wanted to see happen was to keep these people in jail and keep the women and their families safe. So we still have a lot more to do. And I know that both sides of parliament will work together to make sure that that happens because none of us, not one of the MPs in the Queensland parliament wants to have to attend yet another Red Rose rally. Uh, we need to keep our women and children safe and I absolutely commend the likes of Betty Taylor and the Red Rose Foundation, uh, Sherelle Moody from the Red Heart Campaign um, and all those domestic violence warriors who are out there in our local communities trying to make sure that we don't have another fatality. Thank you. Thank you, Ros. Oh, good team. Thank you, Tim. Tim, I'm not quite that short. <laughs> um, our um, members of parliament among us are needing to go shortly but there's someone here that's got a really critical message that we um, want people to hear so without further ado can I um, invite Dr Brian Sullivan Brian works with um, men who use violence and um, I've worked with Brian for a long time thanks Brian I pay my respects to the original owners of this land and their leaders, past, present and emerging. Senator, Premier, Leader of the Opposition, Ministers and Shadow Ministers, special guests, ladies and gentlemen, and especially the young people who are here today. Firstly, thank you to the Red Rose Foundation for calling us together again. I want to begin by reading the dedication it, which is found at the front of the Domestic and Family Violence Death Review and Advisory Board Annual Report 2016-17. I quote, We honour the voices of those who have lost their lives to domestic and family violence and extend our sympathies to the loved ones who are left behind, their lives forever changed by their loss. Our efforts remain with ensuring that domestic and family violence deaths do not go unnoticed, unexamined, or forgotten. I also want to honour those today who are keeping women and children alive. I want to especially thank the women and men I work with at YFS and across the Integrated Service and High Risk Team in Logan Bean Lee, and those working tirelessly across the state, both government and non-government, Make no mistake, the fatalities would be increased if it wasn't for your work. These people are unsung heroes and their voices, most of all, need to be heard at the highest levels if you're looking for information about what is wrong with the system. Two contrasting American presidents, Jimmy Carter, who said, the mistreatment of women is the number one 
human rights abuse in the world today. He also said that violence against women is at such high levels because basically men don't give a damn. Forward now to our more contemporary president who stated recently in the face of the Me Too movement, it is a very scary time for young men. 11 women in one month dead at the hands of men and it's a scary time for young men. I got to tell you, I spoke to over 200 young men, 17 to 18 year olds yesterday on respecting and empathizing with women. I didn't detect a whole lot of fear there. So I think this is not the time, uh, this is not a scary time. It's a time to give a damn. It's a time to call us to action. The title of the 215 DFV report in Queensland, not now, not ever, sadly has a ho rather hollow ring to it in the face of 11 women's deaths in a month. Their voices might correct that title to yes now, yes regularly. The voices of those women who have been killed at the hands of men call out for justice and call out for change. I am not sure that really we as a community understand what we are dealing with here. Firstly, do we get the enormity and prevalence of the problem of men's violence. 90,000 call outs to police last year for domestic violence incidents. That's close to 250 call outs per day, every day of the year. 25,000 breaches of domestic violence orders. That's a criminal offence. Secondly, do we understand the severity of the risk factors? There's 15 clearly flagged risk factors for lethality. The majority of the killers had multiple red flags. Nearly all of the perpetrators, 26 of the 27 last year, who killed their partners, were engaged with the criminal justice system. And still, we could not stop them. Thirdly, are we really getting the inadequacy of our systemic responses. We are missing the mark. Our focus has been pretty much removing women and children from harm. Why are we not removing the harm? That harm can come from two sources, violent men and inadequate systemic responses that further victimise victims and excuse and embolden already dangerous men. Currently, our response to the perpetrators of violence is insufficient, flimsy and tenuous. We need action now to change this flaccid response. There's many questions that people working in the sector want to ask, I know. I've got four today that I would like to see answered by our systemic response to DFV. And as our members of parliament re-enter that building, maybe consider your response to these questions. Why can't a man who does not comply with the conditions of a DVO, in other words, who breaches his order, a high risk flag, be held accountable through stronger consequences. Secondly, why can't a man who does not comply with a magistrate's intervention order to attend a program face serious consequences for that non-compliance rather than the silence and passivity that's happening at the moment? Why can't a man who is incarcerated for domestic and family violence complete a pre-release program addressing his violence while he's in jail? And why can't a man complete his domestic 
and Family Violence Intervention Program before he is allowed to finish his time with probation and parole. And one last question, why is this so difficult? I believe this would be one way we could show that we do actually give a damn about women's lives and that we are recommending, that we are addressing the recommendations and learnings from the death review report. I'm glad to hear that is being tabled. I'd be even gladder to hear that was read. Our level of accountability needs to lift and strengthen. We've had royal commissions into banks, aged care and institutional abuse and many other issues. Maybe it's time for a commission of inquiry into our lack of accountability as a systemic response to domestic and family violence, followed by an apology to victims and survivors of domestic and family violence. I wish you well. Thank you, Brian. Brian works at YFS and oversees programs with, he's the manager there of, with 77, Brian, men. Um, and I think they are stark words and Brian from now on, I think we talk about why can't a man rather than why doesn't a woman. Um, calling our next speaker and I'm aware people do need to go and we will give them permission. I'll just come and say hello to the goodbye to the Premier in one second and introduce Kay McGrath, Chair of the Queensland Implementation Council. Thank you Kay. Thank you very much, Betty, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on here today and acknowledge the Premier, the Leader of the Opposition, the Minister, Minister Farmer, Ros Bates, um, Larissa, um, <laughs> taking a selfie, um, Karen Walsh from the uh, Domestic and Family Violence Implementation Council, uh, Deputy Premier Jackie Trout is also with us as well. Thanking you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. Brian, what a powerful, passionate advocate you are. And thank you for those words. Thank you for those challenges. I have a few of my own. I'm not gonna keep you too long. I know it's hot um, and you've been here for a while, but it is a very powerful and important message that uh, we're here to hear today. And it's about calling out violence against women. When I was on my way, I ran into a woman that I know who asked what the Red Rose was about. And when I explained to her that 11 women had been killed, murdered in Australia in the month of October alone, she was shocked and appalled. She had no idea. I reflected on that and I thought, often we turn away from the bad news. Perhaps we have too much on our own plates. Uh, I'm sure that applies to each and every one of us here. And so we choose to perhaps block it out and turn away. This is something that we can no longer ignore. We can't turn away from this. We've laid these roses here today for these 11 women and we've given them names. They were all daughters, sisters, mothers, aunts, nieces, all with a story of their own. You heard Senator Larissa Waters describe this indeed as a national crisis and I believe it is too. And we rightly look to government leaders and to authorities to react and to respond and to protect women. We are making progress. We are making progress. In Queensland, the recommendations have seen improvements in the legal process with increased penalties, the introduction of new criminal offence of non fatal strangulation, the dedicated DV courts, interpreters, new shelters, better integrated responses and support for victims, high risk teams, for instance, on the Gold Coast who are claiming to be saving women's lives. We are gaining ground, but we must make sure that the recommendations and the actions are effective, that they're constantly measured, evaluated, they're monitored, they're reviewed, they're changed if need be. And they're not just a tick box exercise. Because as everybody has pointed out, and as we can see only too well, this is a matter of life and death. And yes, Betty Taylor and your team from the Red Rose Foundation, women are falling through the cracks. But domestic and family violence has gone 
from being a private matter and being kept behind closed doors. Now, there's a national action plan to prevent violence against women. We've seen royal commissions, online movements, public rallies and gatherings and outcries and very public statements such as this. But oh, there is so much more work to be done. And I hope you draw some comfort from this gathering because I certainly have. And here is my challenge to that woman that I met on the way here and to the rest of you. And that is, let's never turn away from these bad news stories. Let's never retreat because it's too hard. It is important to keep challenging ourselves, challenging all levels of governments, big or small, challenging business, big and small, challenging those sporting clubs and churches, local communities to stand up, to come out and hear the message and call out violence against women. As Larissa said, this is a gendered crime and it has been said very eloquently, gender inequality is the core of the problem. It is also the heart of the solution. So until we change our personal attitudes, until we change our attitudes and our behaviours, until we create a world that is more civil, where there is respect and equality, then women and children will continue to suffer and women and children will continue to die. And those families left behind will continue to suffer. On behalf of the Domestic and Family Violence Implementation Council, I would like to pass on our deepest sympathy and condolences to the families of all the women who've been claimed by this shocking crime. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.